Serie A fans, bentornati, welcome back to the Total Football Analysis Serie A podcast. You know our team, I'm your host, Daniel Proc, and I'm joined by Chris Manford, who is also the host of the EPL podcast. Chris, how are you doing? Doing really well. A lot to talk about this week. True, Chris, I'm actually back in Italy. I uh, had to sign five different forms in the different airports around the world. Uh, actually, new decree from the Italian government uh, just labeled Uh, divided Italy into three areas, yellow, orange, and red, according to the gravity of the coronavirus situation. But luckily, professional soccer will not stop. Well, we have a few cultural topics to talk about, including how uh, the Italian teams are doing in European competitions. Chris, with the league, the European games, the travels, it's all happening so fast, and November has just begun. So I'm thinking players must already start to feel worn out, if not mentally, at least physically. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I'm beside myself. I, I don't know how the players do it uh, as, as well as the coaches. Even the kit men <laughs> probably <laughs> need a break. And the kit men, thankfully, are going to get a break for the, after, in the next week with the international break. But I just, you know, all the things we're talking about in terms of potential muscle tears, uh, Lukaku with the, mm-hmm. the um, uh, hurt abductor, Uh, coronavirus certainly in the last couple of weeks have really created a, a huge impact. Very candidly, I wonder out loud this these um, trips uh, to Champions League and Europa matches, you know, makes you wonder a little bit. Uh, I certainly think the international breaks make no sense whatsoever um, to do at this point. But um, money is money, and that's what drives soccer, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Let's go in order and begin with a team standing on top of the table, AC Milan. It is a little surprising to see the Rossoneri still first after six matches. I think that the last time that they held the top position in Serie A was, what, the 1901-1902 season or something like that. That's what it feels like. But uh, it is no longer astonishing to see Zlatan Ibrahimovic scoring goals and leading his side to victory. This time, this past weekend, with a bicycle kick against Udinese, Chris. I wouldn't call it a bicycle kick. I would call it more of a rocket kick. <laughs> um, that being said, a goal is a goal. And, um, uh, you know, Ibra is, is keeping the tradition of the big, strong striker alive and well in Serie A. Well, Milan, I'm going to throw you some numbers. Uh, Milan are top of the league. Uh, it's been 24 games without a loss in all competitions since the June restart. And I would say it's not a coincidence. They're on top of the table. For the fans of statistics, uh, Italy's daily Gazzetta dello Sport revealed that Milan are doing very well in Serie A because they are first in tackles, second in aerial duels, and second in dribbles considered to the opponent. And to me, Chris, this is a signal that the team is alive. They're fighting on every ball. They're bought into that mentality that uh, had been missing or at least had not been consistent in the past years in Milan. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the truth is they're playing some pretty challenging competition in the last few weeks. Uh, they got away with the, in the, with the Milan Derby. Uh, you know, they um, played Roma to, uh, to a tie. Um, and their goalkeeper, Donnarumma, whom you know I've been critical in the mm-hmm. past, uh, is really leading the league in terms of prevented goals, which is oh. – uh, xg minus actual goals given up and um he's just behind uh consigli of susualo uh in terms of uh performance so uh it seems like all cylinders are firing uh and uh you know hats off it's going to create a uh i think we're going to have a really competitive season um in city I'm, i'm really excited about that so remember that when massimiliano allegri was the coach of juventus Uh, he talked about how he sees statistics and soccer. And he said that um, when the team analyst um, came up to him every Monday morning with the stats from the weekend game, he said that he would look only at two stats, which were aerial duels and fouls committed. And mm-hmm. that's how he would understand if his team was actually competing in the game. And looking at AC Milan numbers, they are first in tackles and they are second in aerial duels. So, I would say that Allegri will be pleased with his former side. 
Would you agree? No question. No question. And what really what the what's interesting is I just see Ibra as such a critical element of that team. We know that he's going to get injured at some point. Because, <laughs> well, and it's not bec- it's more because of, of his age, right? I mean, he's uh, it's it, he's going to cycle in and cycle out. So then the question is, in my mind, will AC Milan have the the firepower to continue putting up the goals? Because from a defender's defending perspective, uh, they're doing a fine job. And um, Ibrahimovic is also expected to play tonight in the, the Europa League game that Milan will play against Lille. But let's jump on the other side of the Milan City. We have Inter struggling. They are sixth in the league and last in their Champions League group after losing uh, 3-2 against Real Madrid on Tuesday. Um, Lukaku was absent both for the, the past area game against Parma when Inter drew 2-2. Uh, she'll be back in a week. But perhaps he's, he's just too important for this Inter side because he's just irreplaceable, Chris. The, his skills, you don't find them in any other players in the Nerazzurri roster. And so Conte maybe now has to reorganize the entire way that the team plays. And maybe there's just not enough time to do that. Yeah, I, I think just as I talked about Ibra being so pivotal uh, for AC Milan, I just think with Lukaku, you know, we'll talk about the... Uh, the Champions League game or, um, in a bit, but even the match against Parma, there's just not that extra gear. And, uh, you know, I, I think they'll continue to do well against domestic competition without Lukaku. They're really going to miss them in, in Champions League. Uh, and, you know, they're going to have to use chicken wire and duct tape just to keep that, that team going um, while Lukaku recovers like they do at uh, top uh, American football colleges, right? <laughs> you know, it's, as we've talked about, games every three days. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to be coming up with things. You see a lot of, a lot of uh, youngsters getting their starts because of the first string person got injured, the second string got injured, and all of a sudden you're dipping into your U23s. And uh, let me ask you, what do you got on that uh, Tuesday game that Inter lost 3-2 against Real Madrid? Uh, I know you have some stats to share with us. Yeah, so I guess the key takeaway is um, expected goals was actually pretty even. It was 1.68 and 1.30. And honestly speaking, I think to the eye, the game had its flows. But quite candidly, I was surprised that uh, Inter um, did as well as, as as it could without Lukaku up high. Mm-hmm. And they really had to work hard. I will say that Inter's first goal is probably one of my favorite goals of the season so far. Oof. Um, I just, everything about it worked beautifully. Um, the heel of Nicola Barella, wow. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm s- such an exciting and lively player to see. So I really like that that um, element a lot. In terms of shots on target uh, versus total shots, Real Madrid had 12, Inter had 13 mm. shots. But as far as on target, uh, Real Madrid had seven and Inter had three. Uh, in terms of possession, it was pretty even. So I think the main takeaway is that the stats really kind of support the eye test on this. Quite candidly, I thought that Real uh, was playing a little bit sluggish. They seem to be in a bit of a funk right now. Uh, And I don't know if it's because they don't need to be going in their highest gear, but for some reason the mojo is a little bit off. That being said, they still had the goods for what it takes. Uh, The Dark Knight, um, (laughs) Ramos, um, had that beautiful header. Um, Why um, and how he was left so wide open on a set piece um, I will never understand um, because that, that's the sort of person you want to you want to constantly have your eye on. Wait, are um, you saying that you would closely mark a center back who has scored 103 goals <laughs> for his club? Would you do that? That's a, that's exactly right. I know it's I know it's a new soccer analytics thinking, <laughs> but uh, the, you know you you go where 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 the money is, and and it's. And Ramos is, is playing like money right now. 
Uh, the first goal by Real Madrid, that Benzema, um, was just – that just demonstrates to me, mm. you know, great strikers are at the right place at the right time. And he's probably making those runs, I don't know, 15 or 20 times and nothing comes out of it. But that one time really changes the complexion of the game. So, um, you know, I, I would love, I hope that Real and Inter play again with a healthy Lukaku. Mm -hmm. um, so then we can really see things toe to toe. Yeah, let me give a shout out to Nicola Barella because you mentioned his fantastic assist with the back heel for Lautaro Martinez goal. Uh, La Barella has just been everywhere. He's just the engine of the Inter midfield. And what is impressive to me is that he combines high mileage with quality plays. So those players who base their game on being that dynamic and covering that much space on the field, they might drop some sharpness when in possession. But Barella is in a moment of form that is just enviable. And it's not a coincidence that he's just taken a starting spot even for Roberto Mancini's uh, Italy national team. Yeah, uh, and you would hope with someone that lively and that young, consistency is going to be the key word. Right. That's that's really what he's got to lock in. And that's just going to come with more playing time, you would hope. Yeah, absolutely. And playing at this high level in Champions League. Uh, because you mentioned the the role of, uh, of big strikers or uh, clutch strikers, the savior is back for Juventus. The Bianconeri have averaged four goals per game since Cristiano Ronaldo got back into the squad last weekend after recovering from coronavirus. Juventus beat Spezia 4-1. On the weekend, and they won 4-1 to one in Champions League on Wednesday. Um, he's also helped by the great work of Alvaro Morata. I think he's just doing fantastic with his movements, with his understanding of the game. He just said that he's feeling desired and motivated at Juventus. We might now be able to see the trio of Dybala, Morata, and Ronaldo all together. That would be stellar, Chris, wouldn't it? I think so. I mean, I think Morata has clearly a, a super talented player. And what he really needs is he, he needs to find that place where he feels at home. And uh, we all know this is the second time uh, back in Turin. And, um, you know, then the question is, is uh, once everybody gets on, how do they, will the parts exceed or will the sum be able to exceed the parts? Mm -hmm. um, and that's very challenging when, when you have, egos but I, my sense is that Morata's had good days and bad I imagine a Ronaldo is a champion but he also realizes he's getting a little um little bit older even though the last two games would not indicate it right so I just I think that Juve we're going to see them pick up the pace a little bit you would hope um on this assuming no injuries uh, and they're going to need it given how busy the fixture list is and given how busy uh, that f those that front line three is going to be in terms of they're going to be traveling during the international break. You know, you're right when you say that there are a lot of egos within the Juventus squad, but at the same time, what I like is that many of these egos, many of these personalities are young. If you think about Kuleseski, Chiesa, um, they're young and you can tell that they're okay with um, not being the star because the star obviously is Cristiano. Yesterday there was a... Um, a moment where Ronaldo could have easily passed the ball back uh, to Morata, who could have scored from five yards out. Instead, he took a shot and he missed it. And Morata didn't say anything. He just put his head down and he was, I think he even gave a clap to Ronaldo or something. But if you start seeing Morata getting mad at Ronaldo or in general players getting mad at each other, that's the, the spirit that you don't want. But I think everybody recognizes that Ronaldo is a star. Also, Chris, if we look at his at his wage, like that's a stellar thirty one million, which is twenty what is it twenty three more than the second highest player in in Juventus. So I think that's that helps knowing that okay, he's the leader, he's our star. We work for him, we work together, and we're not gonna be prima donna. So let me ask you this: mm -hmm. what when you have played in the past how often have you had um conflicts with fellow strikers or the so like a benzema venetius type moment i mean how what what can you draw from your experiences in that that's the thing chris you want to have personalities within uh, a roster because personalities bring out 
you know, the most competitive um, aspect of a team. At the same time, they can cause clashes. And when, you, when clashes happen, unity maybe uh, dissolves. And players who are, are more followers, they may see some um, instability in leadership. And in that case, that's not good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to get into that discussion of, uh, of big number nines, Chris, in Italy, in Serie A. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we are seeing a trend here, uh, the so-called attaccante di peso, which translates from Italian into a heavy striker, which actually means a physically structured striker, one that draws the attention of defenders in the box. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of Serie A's top eight clubs curling the table, uh, I would like to go... Uh, to make a rundown of each team so we can see um, who has an attaccante di peso, uh, a physical structure striker, and who doesn't. First in the table is a Similan. We talk about Ibrahimovic. Second in the table is Sassuolo, which is, in my opinion, the only team that doesn't have this big striker. They have Ciccio Caputo, 5'11", 163 pounds, nonetheless has proven to be a killer when it comes to converting offensive chances, five goals in five games, but it's a completely different striker from an Ibrahimovic, uh, a Morata, a Dzeko, a Lukaku, right? Absolutely. Um, no question about that. And walk me through, is it, I'm going to butcher his name, but is it Tersisic uh, from Sassuolo? Um he has done fairly well in terms of successful attacking actions. Mm. What is the role that he's playing at Sassuolo? Well, um, Sassuolo with Boga back is expected to play with Berardi, Caputo, and, uh, um, and Boga. There's uh, Juricic usually um, mm-hmm. in the position of Strequartista, uh, but the highest player, the, the center forward, is, uh, is Caputo. And I'm going to go, uh, go on with the list of, of the other clubs. Okay. Because I do think that he's the only one that really doesn't fit the, this image of the big striker who just um, is a big presence in the box in terms of stature. Uh, third in the table is currently Juventus. We talked about Alvaro Morata. To me, he's deceptively big. He's 6'2", 185 pounds. Uh, then we have Atalanta, Duvan Zapata. We don't need to, to state how, um, how strong and how big of a presence he is for uh, La Dea. Napoli, they bought this past run for Victor uh, Ozyman, big striker, striker as well. Same is true for Inter with Lukaku. Seventh in the, the table right now is Verona with Kalinic, who is 6-1. So I would say that uh, he's still a presence for, um, for his side. And then eighth, we have Roma with uh, Edin Dzeko. I wanted to ask you, because these strikers, uh, they're just uh, clinical. They're just decisive for their team. And uh, maybe Serie A that has this thing where you need a striker who, um, you know, keeps the defenders busy. It attracts one or two defenders because if you look at them, they're at Ibrahimovic and Lukaku. It always needs to be one or two defenders and that creates space for the players around them, right? And if the players around you are goal scorer as well, then you make money. In England, who does and who does not play with a big forward, in your opinion? I'm going to be honest with you. I really think that England is, has really evolved away um, from that role, mm. um, you know, to the point where I'd like to see more of them coming back because mm. uh, so I do think that um, obviously build up uh, is, is very important. And I'm, and I'm really kind of paying particular attention to the big six, but you know, the last on the bench, of the, the big six that first come to mind is Giroud. And uh, mm. I don't think he's going to get any playing time. I actually think that Giroud saved Chelsea last, last season in terms mm. of providing, in terms of goals per 90 minutes scored, really impressive off the bench. Um, so I, I, I see things have evolved. And, and I wonder, Daniele, if, you know, with, with a Lukaku, he is holding up, it with his with back to the goal and that so people know that the first thing they're looking up for is Lukaku right you win the ball in your defensive third you're looking for a quick counter and he's going to hold it up or he's going to run on it um 
how many of the of the seven or eight names you mentioned, how many of them are kind of a classic target that you're hitting maybe a long ball to up in the air that he's going to take and or receive it with his back and wait for his team uh, to uh, to kind of catch up with him? Well, I would say most, if not all of them, except for, uh, for Sassuolo. I mean, mm-hmm. in Atalanta, you have Zapata, very good at holding up the ball. Osimhen for Napoli. Lukaku, like you said, for Inter. Dzeko for Roma. Uh, Kalinic maybe is not as good and as dominant, but I do think that uh, he does the job well. And then, obviously, you have Zlatan Ibrahimovic. You mentioned Giroud. Um, I love Drew. I think that there were rumors about him coming to Serie A. I, th- I think he would have scored a lot of goals because of his playing style. But do you remember at the World Cup when France won in 2018? Giroud didn't score a single goal. And why did he keep playing? Because he attracted the defenders. Because there was always two center backs on him. And they created a space for Griezmann, for Pogba, for Mbappe. That's the kind of uh, playing style that I'm telling you. It's too, it's too important. Having that guy always a threat, always um, standing out in the box. Like I, I think that you are you're uh, you're right when you say that England is moving away from from this kind of striker. Think about Liverpool and and Man City or even Leicester with Vardy. At Liverpool, Firmino is definitely not huge. Uh, Man City plays with Aguero, with Jesus, not big, um, and their goals come from their fo- from the from their wingers mainly. Right? We have Salah and Mane averaging fifteen or twenty. Same from Sterling, um, Mars scores, um, Jesus and Aguero, they, they do score, but they're not, they're not big guys. Um, so the, yeah. only, the only exception I would, I would think is, is Lacassette uh, at Arsenal. Mm. But even he's, first of all, he's having difficulty getting minutes and he can play that role. Um, but I just wonder that, you know, they've been experimenting with the two to three up top and, um, Unfortunately, look, like I said, is, is finding himself out, out of the, uh, the start list mm-hmm. more times than not. So I, I just, I see that position, um, you know, Bamford at Leeds, but he's not your classic target um, striker, though he can certainly head the ball and, and, and stab off defenders. Uh, on, I have on one, ball. Denny Ings at Southampton, but um, is not playing for, uh, you know, a top five slash top eight club yeah you know what i mean um, yeah i would argue that i, I hope that jeru comes to city i hope that lacassette comes to city because i still think they've got a lot in them and i'm all about trying different um patterns of play but i still think uh to use a an, an analogy in another sport mm-hmm. uh in the national football league you've got the baltimore ravens which are not afraid to run it up the middle while as yet everybody else is moving to passing. So it's kind of a reaction to what the new trend is. Uh, and guess what? They're doing awfully well um, with that alternative uh, tactic. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder, I, do, help me out. In City A, do you feel that it tends to be more of a counterattacking type of, of league? And maybe that's why having big strikers may make more sense. No, I think it's, um, well, it depends on, on the team and the opponent, right? If you want to, sure. um, if you want to use the counter attack more often, but it's more uh, that these strikers are, are clever and maybe the players around them know how to use them because when you have a big striker on top, you can almost hit a blind ball. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when you have midfielders who start the run whenever the ball is hit, then now the big target can lay it off. And then when he lay it off, it lays it off, he can spin. And then the wingers can start to run. Um, yeah. Because we have mentioned Chicho Caputo as a swallow, we have to talk about the Nero Verdi. They're flying. Second in the league, four wins, two losses, uh, sorry, two draws, and not a single loss in Serie A. And uh, Sassuolo is the only team alongside Milan and Juventus to not have lost a single game so far. Chris, last summer we were here thinking, can Sassuolo replicate the great performance that they've been doing guess what they are they are for now and and i want to give credit to their goalkeeper uh which is fourth actually first in city a but fourth in of all the big five um leagues and 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 mind you we've only played 
uh, six or seven matches, depending on where you are. But in, in terms of minutes, over 300 minutes, um, he holds that distinction right underneath Oblak. So he's in great company and just above Donnarumma. So you take away those those um, three or four goals that he's saved and, you know, maybe then they're, it's still very good defense, but I do think that individual performances like this, it'll, the jury's still out on whether he can sustain this long. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah. You know who has... Uh, the team who has caused us to freak out a little bit has been Atalanta. And I'm wondering, Chris, uh, they just lost uh, in Champions League 5-0 against Liverpool. I wonder, have Atalanta just spoiled us with good performances? Are they going through a bad moment? What is up with uh, with Ladea? Well, I think it's fair to say Atalanta is going through a bad moment when you lose mm. 5-0 against Liverpool. Um, you know, that I don't... I think when they play again in a week or so or a couple of weeks, that's not, that's not going to happen again. Um, you would hope, um, you know, I, I think in the beginning of the season, we talked about, we had some concerns about their defense. Uh, they, they had a couple of departures. How were they going to gel? Uh, and the head scratcher to this is that their back line, if you look at successful defensive actions per 90 minutes, they're doing really well. I mean, they're, they've got, you know, three players in the top 13. Um, the trick is, is they're giving up a lot of goals. And I don't know if it's the nature of, of the high line that they're playing, a little bit of bad luck. Um, you know, their keeper is, uh, is underperforming a little bit, though, again, it's only five or six games, so don't want to make any big claims to it. Mm -hmm. They're scoring the goals. Um, the question is, is they're not keeping them out. They're tracking even worse than they did last season. And that was really their Achilles heel on can they become a legit mm -hmm. Champions League um, competitor? And I still think the answer is probably not. Mm. Okay. I would disagree. Okay. On one hand, it's true. They have lost two of their last three Serie A games. And now they just lost 5-0 against Liverpool. But I think that the enthusiasm, the energy, the way they work together, the players of the Gasperini, they are going to turn it around. They're going to go back. They're just going through a bad moment, in my opinion, although there are things to fix. Uh, concentration. Let's, let's take the third goal that Liverpool scored, Salah's goal. It came from a corner kick from Atalanta. There was a clearance slash long pass, and Salah just started to zoom through Atalanta's goal and wasn't a 1v1. Salah is too fast to let him on a 1v1. You have to put one player behind him, one player in front of him on corner kicks, right? He was the only man up for, for Liverpool, and he was able to just receive the pass, engage the defender, I think it was Ataboer, on a 1v1, and then score. It was a similar goal to what Menu conceded um, against uh, Istanbul Bazak Seir. I don't know if you remember, everybody was up, and then uh, Bazak Seir they just hit a long ball, and then Menu conceded the goal. That's concentration. That's fatigue. What is it, Chris? It's exactly that. I mean, it's pure sloppiness. It's not, there's plenty of tape that shows that Salah is happy to receive a long ball. <laughs> awesome first touch. And I will tell you that, that finish that he did when he switched from right foot to left foot and the way he finished it, I mean, it was just like the keeper had no shot. Just mm -hmm. no chance, especially since he almost used a defender to obscure the shot coming off so the keeper couldn't get a sight line. You know, I, 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 overall, I agree with you that we can't measure Atalanta by their outing against Liverpool mm -hmm. in the same way we can't uh, measure Liverpool's season with respect to Aston, the Aston Villa game, right, where they gave up seven goals. Um, so I just think that they're going to they're going to do well. I just am hopeful that as individual defenders they're doing really well, but their team defense flat out is not taking care of business either in Champions League or in Serie A. And let's not forget they're overachievers, Chris. They have they are 11th for players wages in Serie A with a, a wage bill that adds up to something like 42 million and they made it to the quarterfinals of Champions League last year. They finished third. 
Um, so the strength is definitely um, just that chemistry that Giampiero Gasparini just somehow manages to create in this group. Even when uh, new players come in, it just seems to click. Um, I, I agree with you, Daniele, but they are literally, uh, with the goals conceded, they're, they've got 13 goals that they've conceded, mm -hmm. which puts them in the lower half of the league. And mm -hmm. you just, you can't, if you're going to vie for the top three or four, you're just, it, it, it doesn't work. Unless your name is Liverpool, right? Who have the most goals scored on them uh, of, of any, any team in, in the Premier League right now. And they're in first place. But I just, um, I, I'm going to keep harping on that defense until I hear otherwise. I think their, their keeper will come back into form over time. Let's hope that. Uh, I think there's some good old fashioned coaching that can improve the outcomes of this because I don't question the quality of the players. I just question how the players are cooperating with each other and not giving up the sort of goals that you've just mentioned. On Sunday, I'm sure you will wake up early and wear your Lazio jersey for the Lazio Juve game. Um, there has been some chaos uh, concerning COVID uh, for Lazio. Luis Alberto and Chile Immobile should be out, but Felipe Caicedo has replaced uh, Immobile in a very, very good way, scoring heavy goals lately at Torino and then in Champions League against Zenit. There's a lot to decide for Pirlo. He's probably going to... Um, use some rotation with Kulezeski back in the starting lineup. Ronaldo for sure will play. Chris, last year, Lazio-Juventus was supposed to be the decisive game for Scudetto before Lazio dropped so many points uh, leading, that to, leading to that matchup. How do you see that game this year and at this point of the season? Honestly, I see it Juve, Juve, Juve for this match because Love. of... Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's it's a five letter word. It's COVID, right? I mean, I just really feel like they don't have the depth. Um, and, um, you know, you, I'm hopeful that they've done fairly well in terms of champions league. Um, so let's, you know, that's, I, I wouldn't say that if I were running the team, but that's kind of what my focus would be, <laughs> would be champions league because you don't have the depth that you need. Um, and, you know, I worry that Juve is going to start firing on all cylinders because, frankly, they've been really sluggish so far. And, uh, you know, but that's because they don't have all their pieces in place in the same way that Man City didn't have all their pieces in place. And they're just going to be coming back online in the next week or so. So this game is going to start at 6.30 a.m. on Sunday. But promise me that you won't go to bed, won't go back to back to bed right after because, you know what, we have Atalanta, Inter. I always like when mirroring or similar formations play each other. In this case, we have um, two managers, Gasperini and Conte, both employing uh, a three-man back line. And then it's going to be a 3-4-1-2, shaping into a 3-5-2 defensively. We have Lukaku out, uh, according to Gazzetta dello Sport. There should be Muriel instead of Zapata, so we're not going to see Lukaku against Zapata. What else should we look for in this game? Well, I just wonder if Inter is going to be able to keep the really extraordinary form they had during the week. I mean, they clearly got up for Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. um, I thought they, I mean, I mentioned earlier, they outperformed my expectations greatly. I worry a little bit that this might be a 3-1 Atalanta um, win because I feel like uh, if they uh, are a little bit fatigued, um, maybe a little de-energized, of course, Atalanta just got its its uh, rear end handed to them by Liverpool. So, uh, you know, I, Atalanta's got some got some youth. Um, so, I'm suspecting that uh, Inter's going to have a bit of a blip, and without Lukaku to kind of to to be their anchor, uh, it's going to be a difficult uh, match for them. What's your? What take? I think I think that uh, because both teams cannot afford losing anymore because they just got. They came out of uh, uh, a bad time. They came out of uh, each of them came 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 out of a uh, of a defeat. So because of that, I think they're both going to be very concentrated and precise defensively, which will make the game 
um, maybe lead the game into a stalemate. So I'm going to go for a 0-0 zero, zero or 1-1. One, one. All right. Well, I hope uh, my prediction is much more than yours because a uh, 3-1 is a whole lot more interesting than a 0-0. Zero, zero. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the internet the, – uh, folks will be jetting off to their respective international teams shortly thereafter. So mm-hmm. I do think that they're clearly going to want to bring their best team out and try to get this win, um, probably to the disappointment of the international managers, which are going to have some some broken pieces or some pretty tired campers uh, show up to their uh, international games. Absolutely. Well, uh, Italian culture is always a matter of pleasant discussion, Chris. So thank you for taking part in it. And uh, we will see you guys next week after round seven of Serie A. A presto.